Hello, welcome, welcome, number knitters. I'm Kelly from Knit Swag. Thanks for coming tonight. It's Sunday night, so you know what that means. We're going to be talking about number knitting by our favorite knitter. Well, my favorite knitter. No offense, anyone. <laughs> Virginia was Bellamy, and um, it's been a couple weeks since we've um, gotten together and. Gosh, I have a lot of a lot of great stuff to share with you this week. And if you're new here, um, Number Knitting was published in 1952. It is the original modular garter stitch book, and it is the, the like the culmination of Virginia's work over uh, over about a decade. She had her knitting patterns published. Actually, now that I think about it, almost two decades she had her knitting patterns published, and this is her her life's work. Um, and so we're going to be going through it, some other patterns. And also this week we've got, um, I've been collecting McCall's needlework um, and knitting crochet and home decorating. And I've got, I counted them today. I've got 24 of these things. And so what I'm doing is I'm in the process of scanning them all um, so that I can, you know, have a closer look at them and have a better understanding of the kind of uh, influences that Virginia had in uh, her own creative life as she was developing this masterpiece right here. So um, let's let's get right into it. And um, I think it, it's been a couple of weeks since I brought out Virginia's other book. She um, So Number Knitting was the only knitting book that she ever published and it was just published one time and that's why it kind of fell into obscurity because she was uh, first and foremost a poet. And so um, she also published this book. Actually, some friends first published it right, right after she passed. But I thought, you know, since this show is dedicated to the brilliance of Virginia, like it would be a great, great idea to just read some of her poetry every week. And so we're gonna kick off today's, um, today's study into Virginia with one of her poems. So let's bring that up. Today's poem is entitled, let me get this one, that's a little closer. It's entitled Window. They put a window in my house. Long years the house has stood with a roof drawn over wrinkled brows like a dark hood. Down to the bone and through of it to the essential beams, they split the ancient hue of it and ripped the closed seams. More light, but here a prop is gone. The secret framework is disturbed to let in more of tree and sun. And I have heard in the still kindness of the night, a tremble running through it as if the informing wonder of new light had a threat to it. Love it. I love how Virginia was even able to take such um, such everyday activities as getting a window put into her house and making a poem a poem out of it. <laughs> she, she truly was a, a very, very creative and, um, and brilliant woman. Okay, so we've read Virginia's poem. Um, so in my historical research, I've gone through ancestry records. I've gone through like all the McCall's needlework. I've been, <laughs> I've been collecting so many of these. Um, and these are all, you know, great treasure troves of Virginia's influence into her creative uh, endeavors. But another another publication that um, she was a part of uh, and had her, some of her work published in was called Hand Weaver and Craftsman. And she actually mentions that in um, in the number knitting book. So I want to show you. Uh, I'm going to bring up my my screen here and and search for that so you can see where it was. Uh, that it was mentioned. So she was going through the story of how she developed this book and her, her number knitting method. And this is in the introduction. And um, it reads, this paragraph reads, Craft Horizons asked for an article and other articles followed by Ethel Eaton in the Christian Science Monitor, by Dorothy Tooker in the New England Homesteader, and by Louise Jureka in the Handweaver and Craftsman, and the Pathfinder rang up from Washington to ask for an interview by telephone. And so what's, what's interesting about Handweaver and Craftsman is Virginia, 
as far as we know, she never mentioned being a weaver or a spinner, but she was uh, she was featured in Handweaver and Craftsman. They had to, they did a whole article on her. Um, but what I what I found in my um, my research in the the web archive, um, she also advertised in here her uh, correspondence courses, and I thought it was just in a couple uh, a couple of course like a couple of issues, but I was digging around. Um, in the web archive and I found that she was I think she advertised her courses in like at least four maybe five different issues and this is a new one that I found just this week um, and this is um, this is on page 44 Virginia Bellamy's number knitting the new patented handcraft the only circular stretch fabric learn by correspondence course for full details write directly to Virginia Bellamy Elliot Maine um, and so I think one of the reasons that that I had a hard time finding this um, for a while is because she didn't use her middle name generally when she, you know, wrote articles or, you know, had her work published in McCall's and um, Handweaver and Craftsman and different uh, newspaper articles. I have a bunch of different newspaper articles about her. She always uses her her full her full name Virginia Woods Bellamy now Woods is her maiden name but she she almost always used it but there's a few a few instances that I found where um, that was either abbreviated it was just like an initial Virginia W Bellamy or in this case it was omitted entirely and so that's I think why it um, it was a little hard for me to, to find at first um, but I thought it would be neat to show you how um, how I found some more of the the places in Handweaver and Craftsman that she actually did have work published, and so I'm in the uh, this is in the the web archive. Um, I did a search for Handweaver and Craftsman, and uh, the way I found this this is all of the the issues, and so let's just say I, I found one right, but I wanted to find I wanted to find them all. Like if this had just come up in a search, um, what you can do is um, is click click here, Handweaver and Craftsman. Sometimes it's also a t like a tag. Um, oh, here it is, publication pub underscore Handweaver dash Craftsman. So if you click on that collection, it will show all of the Handweaver and Craftsmans that were uploaded, which I'm pretty sure is all of them. This publication was from 1950 to 1975, uh, and it's got you know. I think it came out with four issues a year, but then it also had indexes or indices, I guess is the plural word. Um, and she's mentioned several times in some of those. But this is, here's the really cool thing about this search. Like normally if I do a search on the web archive and I search for Virginia Woods Bellamy or Virginia W Bellamy or Virginia Woods, it's gonna bring up like a bazillion things. There's apparently a town somewhere in the Northeast called Virginia Woods. And so it's going to bring up like all the instances of Virginia Woods, this town, like, well, that's great, but that's not at all relevant to what I'm searching for. And so sometimes when I'm, I'm searching, it brings up too many, too many instances of things that are sort of what I'm looking for. Like it, it, like it'll flag the word Virginia or it'll flag the word Bellamy or it'll flag the word Woods. But like if I need the, the, all three of those, and I know specifically like the documents that they're supposed to be in, this is this is a great way to narrow it. So I'm in Handweaver and Craftsman. This is the whole series in the web archive. And within here, I search for Bellamy. Search this collection. Oh, here's what you need to do. Search text contents, that's important. Search this collection, text contents. And so the word Bellamy, or the name Bellamy appears, let's see, uh, six, that's 10 times. And sometimes it's Virginia, like um, this one is Virginia, but this one, the second one is somebody named Rachel Bellamy. Um, the third one is also Rachel Bellamy. So we've, we've got Virginia in here several times, and then also Rachel Bellamy in here um, four times. And so if you're looking for um, like a way to narrow your search, more specifically to to just a certain publication, this is a great, a great way to do it. Hey, Rose, welcome. Um, so I wanted to bring up this 
this issue of Hand Weaver and Craftsman, this is a very cool, it's a very cool issue besides, I mean, all of, all of these Hand Weaver and Craftsman are really interesting because they talk about like, you know, like the, um, what was going on in American hand weaving and spinning from this 25 year period from 1950 to 1975. And in, in my understanding of like the American craft movement, I thought, I don't, I, mean, I guess I know why, like I thought that basically hand spinning and weaving was like kind of dead until the hippies came over and like revived it. But that absolutely was not the case. It was not dead. It was very vibrant and there was a lot going on. But I think the, the, you know, the hippie movement, like my aunt Linda, who, who brought, she went to Australia in the seventies, brought back um, a loom and spinning wheels and hand cards and you know, a, a drop spindle, like all this stuff. Um, she was part of that, that time frame where the young people finally were like, oh, okay, this is like this whole crafty fiber thing is very, very cool. And I think there was like more of awareness amongst the young people at that point in time. But from 1950 to 1975, there was this amazing magazine um, that was put out. And I encourage you to go to, um, to, go to the, the link below in the description to read some of those, uh, some of those issues because they're, they're phenomenal. Um, one, one of the ones that I, I found recently that I thought was really interesting was uh, it's called hand spun yarns made by the blind and I know that like the whole the whole idea of accessibility and like you know helping disabled people have like a, a more functional um, functional life I think that I think it's people are more aware of it generally um, than maybe in previous generations but in previous generations they were aware of it maybe not quite as much like on a wide like societal level but they were aware of it and so this particular article it it really struck me because i thought that's that's not something that you hear about too much like like what what employers and um you know society was trying to do on like a broader scope to help disabled people function and be productive in the society so let's take a look at it <coughs> this is called hand spun yarns made by the blind It's by eugene de Morgat, and he talks about why um, hand spinning, like how, how blind people can do it and the adaptations that they would need. Um, this one, he, he talks about how they need an electric spinner and the, the kind of the um, process that they went through in order to, um, to get that going and what kinds of yarns people can make and how they worked with the National Industries for the Blind. Uh, it says, it is uh, National Industries for the Blind is responsible for the allocation of government orders. This was the start of more regular work for blind employees and an inspiration for continual experiment with new projects such as hand spinning. And I, um, I love this. So it's, it's kind of a brief article, um, but I love the fact that it brings attention to um, spinning by blind people. Also, I found in the back here, um, he himself, this guy Eugene, himself is blind. He has only 2200 vision, which classifies him as blind. And um, like what kind of work he did before and you know, his education and, um, and what led him to becoming a, a, blind, a blind spinner. And I think that's, um, that's awesome. So thanks out to Eugene Moore, Moore Grit for contributing this, <laughs> this article. Thank you, Eugene. All right, um, so that was that was Hand Weaver and Craftsman. And again, check those out. Um, it's just it's such a great it's such a great resource because I, I feel like it, you know in our generation because we've got computers, we've got YouTube, we've got you know all these new books. Like it's it's easy to overlook all the expertise and the wisdom of all the craftspeople that came before us um, just because they didn't have computers. But I think sometimes, a lot of times, that their skill was probably more <laughs> than ours is because they didn't have computers. <laughs> so um, that's great. All right, up next, speaking of computers, I have been working very hard on, on scanning, uh, scanning these magazines. I got, through, I got through two of them so far. The one I've been doing, um, most recently is 
Um, this is McCall's, McCall's Summer 1948. And so um, if you remember, Virginia, she published her, her number dating pamphlets, I think from like 1945, um, maybe 1944 up until like 46. She filed for her patent in 45. Um, she got her patent um, filled, granted, in 1948. And then in 1952, she published her book. So what I've been trying to do is understand, um, since she mentions this magazine or this, you know, this publication in her, her number knitting book several times, um, and they, you know, they published some of her leaflets, uh, I thought it would be good to, you know, find out like what, what kind of input she had going on in her life. Um, so uh, some time ago, I did a few, a few months ago, I got a ginormous scanner, and it is, um, it's an 11, 1117, or no, it's bigger than that. Um, it's like this big. <laughs> it's a big scanner, and so I can scan these gigantic 1117 documents. And so I went through, and I scanned this, this whole thing, and um, I want to share with you some of the cool things that I've... Um, that I found in it, some of the things that really um, that really struck me. So the first one, as I'm going through this, the first one is on page 24. All right, so we've got we got page 24, and these. Let me bring up a little closer view of this. This thing, this whole spread here, it says, "Look this way, please," and I'm like, "What in the world is going on with these headpieces?" And so I started reading. Um, number 1378, new hat, new love. Both take years off your face, especially this pretty halo hat with a double puff. And it's, it's kind of wild. I've never seen a hat like that before. But what struck me about this particular hat is that um, in... Um, I've been trying to figure out what in the world a halo is. And so if we go over to the, well, first of all, I was looking on YouTube to try to find out what a halo is. <laughs> and, and I found like different, different ways to wear like a do-rag. Um, and like, that's not really applicable for 1940s knitting. So I was like, that's not, that's not right. I haven't had any luck finding on the interwebs, finding out what in the world a halo is. But then I found it in this book. Uh, and so the reason that the word halo got me was because of this page in number knitting. And so we're on page 48, and this is called the single wing halo. And this this section is in the introduction. In, it's sort of just after the introduction, where um, if you look at the bookmarks, um, there's how to number knit is kind of like the main section. And then she, she teaches you how to knit each of the seven units. And then she gives you an actual project for each one of these seven units, you know, what you can make with a square, what you can make with a rectangle, so on and so forth. And, and if you go down to number six, this is called a single wing. Um, let's see, uh, how to knit the single wing, here it is. And she tells you how to knit it, and then she gives you a chart. Here's how you knit the single wing, and you can knit it like right slanted, or you can knit it left slanted. And then she gives you a pattern for halo. So you're, you know, you cast on here and then knit, you're increasing on one side, decreasing on the other and working your way across. And this is, this is the halo. You twist it up and put it on your head. So the, the fact that she actually mentions a halo, it's, she was, she was very much in, in um, tune with the fashion of the day which is great. She was a pretty fashionable lady. Um, the other things on this that I noticed, uh, 137, um, let's see, I guess 1378 is also this blue one? I'm not sure. Oh, here it is. Another romantic style has a smart side drapery. And I guess this is, Maybe the 1378, it came with like the same, they came as part of the same leaflet, I think so, because they had the same number. But what's interesting to me about this one is like it's, it sort of looks like a, 
like a veil, like a nun's veil, but it's in blue. But check this out. It's what's what's really interesting about this is it's like it's a, like a helmet sort of a thing, and it's got this just drapey thing on the side. But her hair is coming out the back, which is which is I th at thought I thought at first that's a little that's a little odd. But then remember we've been working on um, and I don't know if you if any of you were working on this with me the um, four pointed scarf. Um, that's also, we're doing an it along until the end of September, which is, <laughs> we're just coming up quick. So chop, chop, if you haven't done that yet, um, to be part of the, um, the giveaway contest. I don't know We're I'll do it. I'll, whoever finishes one of these, I'll put you in for, uh, like entering a chance to win. And, um, because our group is so small, your chances are exceedingly high that you will win. Okay. But. The reason I mentioned this is because this is the, the four points scarf from Virginia. And she says in her leaflet, there's a few, a few different ways that you can wear this. She says at least a half a dozen different ways. Um, and I tried to come up with a half a dozen different ways. And one of the ones I came up with was, was this, which, you know, it looks, it looks a little odd, but you know, it's summer in North Carolina. So, um, if it was like, you know, winter in Maine, as it may have been when she designed this, it might not look so odd. But what's, what struck me about this, this scarfy thing in comparison with this one in the book is if you flip around, the hair comes out, it comes out the back, just like in the book here. This is another style where the head is totally covered, but the hair comes out the back of the hat thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another fun uh, couple of little details I thought about this is on this one down at the bottom. This is 1371, which has some similarities to the um, four point scarf I just modeled. And it says, use some of the new weatherproof satin twill or perhaps your old favorite plastic <laughs> love it i love me a good plastic hat but i don't know my my grandma she used to wear um on rainy days she would wear like a like a clear plastic rain bonnet so i guess that was a thing um back then was wearing plastic headwear it makes sense you know now we'll wear hoodies or we're just we'll we'll get wet but i mean if you only had your hair done up at the beauty parlor like once a week you'd want to you want to keep it nice and dry and and plastic would would fit the bill. Mora, hello. Um, you just started your scarf. That's great. That is great. And Rose is on unit 19 of the wing, the winged blouse. Excellent. And um, I know that sometimes these things take longer than <laughs> we think they should, especially that winged blouse. Oh my gosh, that thing was a that thing was hard. And I started the, the bodice blouse a few months ago and I, I'm still, I'm still garnering, garnering the courage and the motivation to, to fix it after like the, <laughs> it fit me like a, like a giant potato sack. I will fix it. I've just, my motivation has almost come back. So good work ladies for continuing on, um, <laughs> in your, your knitting endeavors for these knit alongs. Oh, Hey Bob. Welcome. All right. Oh, what else is next? Another fun thing I saw in this, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> That's better. All right. Um, in this magazine on page 47. Okay. So what got me about this one, it's, it's not the little baby sweater, like that's cute, but what really struck me about this is it says in big letters, easier, faster to crochet lovely things. Where is it? Well, now I can't find it. <laughs> so in several of Virginia's um, 
advertisements in McCall's needlework, there, there's some text that says number knitting. It's easier, faster, and, uh, oh, here it is, and cheaper than ordinary knitting. So let me bring that up. Uh, I had just forgotten where, where it was. Here we go. So this is the number knitting ebook that I made. And if you look, if you look at this cover, there we go, all the way at the bottom. A simple to learn method that is easier, faster, cheaper than ordinary knitting. And that same verbiage, easier, faster, is on page 47 of this book. And so this was five years before her number knitting book. And so I kind of wonder if like some, like that phrase stuck out in her mind when she was developing the design for the, the cover of her own book. <clears throat> All right, also on page 73. I like to read different kinds of, um, you know, see like different kinds of yarns that people were using. So on page 73, I've never heard of this before. This is called Chanella Cotton Yarn by Shaggy. Those allergic to wool can now enjoy smart hand knits made in California for a cool comfort. Knits like wool, looks like wool, feels like wool, cooler than wool. It costs only half as much as wool. I need to see if I can find more information about the Shaggy Yarn Company because I've never, I've never heard of them before. I wish I could, I could zoom in and like see, see what it's like. Maybe I could find some on, um, on Etsy or like, because I, I kind of feel like it would be a chenille, like a chenille cotton yarn, but this, um. This doesn't look like it would be knit in a chenille. So like, it sort of looks like it might be like a light fingering weight. Um, I don't know. And there's nothing in, in my experience with knitting with cotton, there is nothing about it that knits like wool, looks like wool or feels like wool. And so because of the, the outline on this, um, the shaggy text, I kind of wonder if it's like a, like a really lightweight cotton chenille. I would be curious about that. So I'll put that on my list of things to research. All right, next up, this is, this is funny. Okay, so, you know, things are more, more politically correct now. And like people get really offended at cultural misappropriation or, you know, like if we offend someone from another nationality or another country or like whatever, like people are super sensitive about that these days. But in, you know, days gone by not so much <laughs> and so um and i think it's i think it's a valid as like a creative um choice or even you know just to appreciate someone else's culture to use design elements from other countries i think that's great um but what's interesting about this particular this particular book there's so many things they there's so many references to mexico in here so many so let me show you this. Um, this is on page 26. And it says up here, Visa to Mexico. <laughs> and I did a search. I did a search today to find out like, well, first of all, did we need visas to go to Mexico in 1940s? I don't know. I haven't been able to determine that. But I do know that during the 1940s, because a lot of men had been, you know, American men were like, you know, part of the war effort. There was a big movement by the, the federal government to like recruit low paid farm workers to work the fields here. Like, you know, I think that, you know, they're still doing that. But um, also in the 40s and 50s, Mexico, oh man. Also in the 40s and 50s, Mexico had, um, they started developing like tourist, tourist resorts. And so there was a, a lot more interest in Mexico. And so those designs um, that people probably were encountering down in Mexico, they started, they started making their way up here. And um, so let me just show you some of them. This is on page 26 
I've also got one on page 63. I thought there was just one or two, but then I got to looking and I was like, oh my gosh, there's, <laughs> there's way more than I thought. 63, um, night and day, take a trip to Mexico via your needle. Embroider gay fiesta peasant scenes on your newest lounge jacket, um, which is which is great. There's nothing nothing Mexican about that jacket except the motifs. I don't know, like if if Mexican women embroidered motifs like that. I mean, maybe it's cute though. Um, also, page sixty eight had more Mexican themed designs. Here we go. To Mexico we'll go. Jivey Mexican felt jackets embroidered with colorful peasant appliques are a must with the big and little girls who dress smartly. And then on page, you know, I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up my computer screen because one of the things I did this week, I digitized this whole thing and I made it searchable. So let's just, let's look at it on the big screen because I'm having, having some camera issues. So we're going to go to page 83. 83 is next. Here we go. More Mexican inf inspired designs. This headpiece kind of looks like Holland to me, but that's okay. And also on page 84, there's even more Mexican themed. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a little girl, I had um, my, my great aunt had made um, blankets, like little quilts for us, and she embroidered in this style, not Mexican themes, but like it was, it was, um, it was embroidery of this style in the, the little quilts that she made for us. And um, I thought that was very sweet. And there's even more Mexican designs. <laughs> Must have been really very popular this year. So here you could, again, embroider designs on a jacket. And I think all of these were from different, either different design houses or like different manufacturers or something. And it must have just been a hot trend that year. Um, This is perfect for your lazy days in the sun. I don't know that maybe people wore these sun tanning. I'm not sure. Interesting idea. Yeah, so that's that's the, the Mexican theme stuff, which I thought was fun. Um, another th interesting thing in this particular issue. So you know how it's it's common for us to really, like culturally, people like to study things from our grandparents' era. And like once, once we get far enough removed from it, it's about 75 years old um, or so, it becomes vintage and it's cool. And it's not like, um, it's not dorky anymore, if that makes sense. Like I grew up in the 80s and the 90s and I remember stuff from, you know, the 60s and the 70s that my grandparents still owned, they still used it, but I was still too close to it. It was only like, you know, 10 to 20 years old. And so I was like, wow, that's so passe. Like, you know, granny and her, her avocado green fridge or her, you know, plastic sofa or her, you know, gold flowered couch or whatever. Um, but once you get far enough removed from that, it's suddenly like, woo, that's really cool. And I don't think that's new to us. <laughs> People have been doing it for probably as long as there's been people. And um, so if you look on page, um, this is on page 74. And so if you, this magazine was published in 1948. And so um, th this couple is doing a throwback to, if it was the gay 90s, um, that would have been, about 60 years prior, which kind of goes along the lines of like, this is what some of the designs that their grandparents would have enjoyed. Um, I don't know if this is how people decorated their homes 
in in the 1890s because I, I my understanding was that sort of was like a Edwardian period with or maybe Victorian period it was more ornate um, but maybe this was just like their 1950s take on what the 90s um, were like with like the poofy sleeves and the the hats and the barbershop quartets with the handlebar mustaches and all that um, and they're saying you can embroider it frame it put it on the wall you can have aprons with 90s stuff, bicycles. Uh, you can paint it on your kitchen walls. And you can also do charcoal drawings of the 90s, which I love. I love that. All right, also, page. So another thing I like about these magazines is they give us a glimpse into like what the technology was at the time, not just for like yarn manufacturing, but also like knitting notions and knitting needles and tools and crochet hooks and like all the little, you know, bits and bobs and, and all that. And here is another one that I thought was really, really interesting. This is on page um, 64. Um, here we go. And it's called Measure as you knit with ruler needles. Save time hunting for a ruler or tape measure. Save dropping stitches when measuring your work. Use these ruler needles. They have their own ruler mark right on them. It's permanent and will not rub off. It's available at JCPenney, JJ Newberry, and SS Crisg stores. 30 cents a pair. And you know now, like, I mean, I could kind of see myself using those because I I don't do like a strict strict gauge swatch where I, you know, I make a, a six inch square and then I wash it and block it and <laughs> I, I probably should sometimes, but I don't. I kind of eyeball it. So I could, I could see myself using the, the ruler needles. Um, it's, it's not going to give the most accurate result, but um, it was a pretty interesting idea at the time and I don't think in all of um, number knitting Virginia she never talks about she talks about make, making sure that you like make your you know test your 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 gauge make sure that you you hit your gauge that you're supposed to but she doesn't ever talk about like washing it and blocking it or anything um, as part of that process so maybe that that idea didn't come along until later or maybe it was just like so common like they didn't even mention it I'm not sure yeah. Um, okay. So the the women's hint exchange. Oh, let's. Uh, Maura says a visa. A visa wasn't needed until we had to get passports after 9/11. That is good to know. Because I think now, when I was growing up, I lived in San Diego, and so if you wanted to go to Mexico, you had to just have, like, have government ID, which for me, like, was you know from the local junior high school. Like, it wasn't a big deal. Um, I think now you have to have a passport to go to Mexico. I don't know when that started. It might have just been in the last few years. Um, I do know people from Mexico coming to the U.S. They have to have a visa, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I know, you know, we've always had to have visas to like go. No, just passports. You know, I don't really know anything about visas, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, yeah. And Maura also says, I have a wool jacket from Mexico from the 60s. Oh, it was a yellow wool felt with big appliques. Nice. Got it from a relative who lived in San Diego at that time. I would love to see it. I would, I would love to see that. Yes. <laughs> Post a picture in our, our Ravelry group if you use Ravelry. But that would be awesome to see that. And Rose says that ruler needles sound like the needles that have the ruler on them now. I would like to get some of those. I think that would be really interesting to work with because I kind of, I eyeball it. And, you know, it generally works out okay. Um, but it would be nice to have the ruler right on the needles because sometimes I'm like, you know, I, I, I estimate a little bit off. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's just some of... Women's Home Companion, um, but I did want to show you, like what what the process is that I go through 
when I make one of these PDFs because it's it's kind of a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. Um, so I've already done this one, um, but let me show you what a, a little bit about what goes into it. So I'm in Acrobat. This is the full version of Adobe Acrobat. This is not the um, the reader version, the free reader version. This is the full paid for version. Um, and in here, I go File, Create, Combine Multiple Files um, into a single PDF. I'm just going to do like, I don't know, 10 pages so you all can see like what the, the process is. I'll do those ones. I'll click Add Files. And because I named them properly, like I named them by page number, they're automatically going to show up in the right order. Uh, and then I'll just click Combine. And it's going to think about it for like two seconds. And there it is. Um, now sometimes, because of the way my scanner is, sometimes like some of the pages are, are like upside down, which is fine. I could either, you know, do them individually here. Um, there's also a way to do them like globally. There we go. So I'll show you that. Um, I'm going to go to pages over here on the right hand side, organize pages. This, this panel is neat because it lets you choose like which pages that you want to do what to. So like if you just want the odd pages or you just want the even pages or you know whatever, you can select those. Like if, if I knew that every even page needed to be rotated 180 degrees, I could just like do it all at once. Um, but in this case, I just need to do like uh, I think those ones. So I'll just take those and I'll flip, flip those around. Great. Now some of the times like um, the like there's some extra stuff from the other page here. And so I'm going to go over to the edit tool and click on this and then right click edit using Photoshop. And here in Photoshop I can I can crop it. I can also if I wanted to uh, edit this in camera raw and like do some some color correction like that's a little yeah that doesn't look good that's a little too blue that looks better though if you if you press the P button like preview it will um, it will show you the before and after and now all I have to do is save this and so if you look at this file number here it says acro 3669 blah 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 like I go over here to Adobe Acrobat and it like already it replaced the page here for me because before it was like there was extra stuff on the side and now there's not. Um, yeah, so like I could just go and do that with all the pages and that's, you know, part of what I'm, what I'm doing when I'm scanning these, um, these old magazines for, you know, posterity is to like make them nice like this. So I'll just save that one. I know it's upside down here, but in Acrobat, it's actually, it's correct. So anyway, I just wanted to give you guys like a sneak peek um, another thing that I do when I, when I prep my, my archival magazines, I use something called optical character recognition. And so, um, OCR. And so what that does is it's just going to recognize the text in here. And this shouldn't take too long because it's only 10 pages, but it's just going to go through and, um, and recognize all, all the text. And so that way, when I'm searching for particular words like knitting needle or Bellamy or, um, I don't know, nylon or wool or military or like whatever keywords that I want to search for, it will just, it will enable me to find them um, right, right in the PDF. Easy peasy. And so that's, that it will take just a moment and then I'll show you how, um, how I can then search for the text. Probably should have done that just on a couple pages, but that's okay. It's almost done. As I'm as I'm scanning these documents and you know running the OCR and cropping them and editing them, it's like it's really good. It slows me down a bit, so that I'll actually spend some time um, looking at the ads and looking at the articles and like really getting a better understanding. Because I'm not just seeing it once; I'm seeing it every time I scan a page, every time I crop a page, every time I edit a page, every time I, I do anything. I'm looking at it over and over and over again, um, and so I can, you know, I become familiar with it. 
And so like here, I'll do a search for the word yarn and it shows up uh, in 16 different places in this magazine. Yeah, so that's, that's um, my, my acrobat process. All right, uh, let's talk about let's talk about a new book that I discovered, and then we'll get into some the number knitting, the strictly number knitting things. So this is this is called Knitting uh, Stitch Lead Design, and it is by Allison Ellen. And I, um, I got, this is the interlibrary loan sticker. <laughs> I took this off of the last one and uh, before I returned it and, you know, so I could show off the book at the, on the show. And I kind of got chastised by the librarians <laughs> for, for taking the sticker off. Anyway, so I was like, all right, I'm going to be a good girl. I'm like a responsible library patron. I'm not going to take the sticker off, even though I really want to. <laughs> so someone, um, someone recommended this to me. I, I honestly forget who it was, but they're like, surely you've heard of this. And I was like, no, I haven't. Um, can I take this cover off? I can't. Oh, they're going to know if I take that off. Anyway, so this is, I think this woman is in England. I'm going to say yes, she's in England because there's the price here is in pounds. Um, this is this is a great book. It has a lot of mitered mitered square type stuff in it, and um, I this particular basket, I think it's a basket bag thing. It reminds me very much of a. Um, let me see if I can find you. Um, the one that I did that's that's similar that's got the same feel to it here it is so this is one I did oh if you want to get the free five point scarf just go to the Knit Swag website and this thing will pop up and you enter your email and you can get the scarf pattern so we'll tuck that away so this is one I did, um, I don't know, maybe a year, oh yeah, August 11th um, or so ago. And it's, it's made with one skein of yarn. It's mostly blue with a band of pink in it. So it's like um, dip dyed, some people call it space dyed. And it's, um, it's all one bit of yarn, one skein of yarn. There's no breaks in it. That's why it's called the no breaks cowl. And so if you look back at this, uh, Maybe camera three will behave with me today. If you look at this particular one, it's kind of got the same feel to it where the, the, the color runs in like opposite directions. And so that's what really caught my eye on this. Um, but I just, I love what she does with, with stitching and color. She lets the, I guess she, she lets the, the, shape of the modular units kind of like dictate dictate the garment and how it how it hangs how it drapes um her her construction is really interesting because you know most sweaters they're like either top down or they're bottom up and that's like your choices occasionally you see one side to side but she does something very similar to virginia in that there's like these big chevrons in there. And so the direction, the orientation of the, the knitting, it like might go up and over. And so it's not, it's not just, you know, unidirectional. It's, um, it's very organic. And I, I love that. And she, she talks about like letting the knitting do what it's going to do. Like this is obviously curled. This is steamed flat. And if you look at this, this is just welting with, um, you know, stocking it in the background versus stocking in the foreground. I mean, you can steam block this out, but she didn't. She let it like behave as it did right off the needles. Um, yeah, so she has a lot of discussion in here about different kinds of ribbing and it's all like beige, but then she, she goes um, and does, here's a, another good example, the same kind of idea with the, the welting, um, but it's, 
I mean, you could steam block the heck out of this and flatten all that out, but the reason this has so much character is because of the stitch pattern in conjunction with the fact that she did not steam block it and she just let it, she let it be. And it's, um, I love that. I love that very much. They got ribbing with uh, welting on the bottom. Oh, come on, camera three, you're killing me. Oh, and this is a really great one. This is different ways of preventing holes when turning short rows. And so she has like one, two, three, four, five, six different methods outlined here of how to have better short rows. And it's just, it's a, it's a tremendous book. Um, I like the fact that she has the line drawings and, she, and also has the um, stitch by stitch instructions. But like for someone that is more, is more interested in just the line drawings, like I could probably look at this and go, oh, I get it. Like I know how to knit it just by looking at that picture. But like I wouldn't, so I wouldn't necessarily have to read you know, all of this and just be so heavily dependent on this. I can look at the pictures and the line drawings and like, roger that. I, you know, I can forge ahead based on that information. You know, I probably get in trouble a little bit because, you know, <laughs> that's how I roll. Um, but her, her line drawings are amazing. She has all kinds of, um, always has these little color coded yarns here. Another thing I noticed that's cool about this is that a lot of knitting books are like, you need to use this color of yarn and this brand of yarn and like, it's very particular. And I don't even think she uses, she doesn't even tell anywhere. I mean, I haven't read the whole book, but she doesn't tell like what brand of yarn this is. She gives you a yarn, uh, probably a yarn weight. And that's about it. And so it leaves the, it leaves the knitter more freedom to choose to make their own choices, which I think is great because a lot of a lot of modern knitting patterns are so particular about like you have to use this yarn and, and it's like um, and I've heard people describe it as like hand holding, like like new knitters don't have the knowledge or the confidence to make the right choices. Like, okay, you know that that's valid. I get that. But like I think that's part of the learning process. Like once, once I know like my fiber, my, my stitch count, my needle, you know, the gauge, like I know how it's going to behave. Like I don't want someone coming in and saying, you have to use this yarn. I'll be like, nope, <laughs> watch me do something else. <laughs> like don't, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> um, and you know, maybe I have a little bit of rebellious spirit in that, but you know, I think I think that Virginia did too. And she didn't like being told what to do. She wanted to do, she wanted to do things her own way. And I feel like this, this book, it, um, it captures a lot of that. And it, it does some other cool things that I haven't seen very many times before. Um, so normally mitered squares, I don't know if you can, I'm gonna bring up uh, camera. Yeah, we're on camera three. Uh, normally mitered squares, if you look at mitered square designs, they're either all mitered squares or they're like entrelock where, you know, the stitches are like this. Um, but this one, I don't know if you guys can see this, this whole row here, these are all mitered squares in stockinette. And this row, like the horizontal rows are not mitered squares. They're just like regular squares, but they're in seed stitch. And so these ones, they are worked like upward and these ones, they're worked diagonally. And this is a really interesting like way that she's done, she's oriented her stitches. I haven't seen anyone else do that before where they, they mix mitered squares with non-mitered squares in sort of like an entrelock fashion. I love that. Um, anyway, I would recommend, like if, if this sort of thing piques your interest, and I suspect it probably will because you're like, you're watching this show. Um, it's called Knitting Stitch Lead Design by Allison Ellen. She has at least one other book. I forget what it's called, um, but there's a link to this particular book down in the description below. And, um, and you can you know, find it on Amazon. And um, she's also on Instagram and she does a lot. 
she does a lot on Instagram. She has lovely stuff. Um, she does, you know, shows and fairs and yeah, it's beautiful. And it looks, it looks very planned. Like there's nothing, there's nothing unintentional looking about it. You know, sometimes when someone wears a sweater that they made and it's like, <sighs> it's like they ran out of yarn halfway through and just like, well, I just got this other stuff, this other fluffy hot pink and you know, olive green, like whatever. I just got this other stuff. I'll just like fill it in. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> haphazard. Like her stuff is not haphazard at all. It's very, very unique, very original. And um, anyway, check it out. So that was knitting uh, stitch lead design. Maura says she has written two other books, hand knitting new directions and knitting color structure and design. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Maura. And Rose says we all have a wild streak in there. <laughs> Word. <laughs> we do. We do. And um, sometimes our loved ones need to help us keep it in check in certain social situations. <laughs> I don't know if you have that in your life, but I have that in my life. And so, um, yeah. So I try to knit classic colors and classic designs because then I can wear my hand knits out. <laughs> okay, what's next? Um, okay, let's talk about let's talk about this blouse right here. This is this is called the Greenwich shirt, and I I let me bring it up in the number knitting book so you can see what. Um, what it looks like on the model. Okay, so we're on page 223. Um, this is in the section about metal yarns for exquisite evening wear. And she talks about over here, the Greenwich shirt, uh, the all metal evening blouse photographed here, here, um, is made of what appears to be a solid gold yarn of smooth texture and a B plus weight, which is like, kind of like a fingering weight or maybe a baby yarn. If I don't honestly know the difference between fingering and baby, maybe baby's a little heavier. I don't know. Uh, it is a tinseled thread wound closely around a cotton twist. This yarn is easy to work with uh, it does not break, it slides smoothly over the needles, and the result is surprisingly satisfactory. This blouse was also an easy model to knit, provided the units of number knitting has well learned, have been well learned, for this is nothing more than the double wing or butterfly unit extending from the central point at the bottom of the blouse to the central neck opening. As seen, as maybe seen in the photograph, there are three butterflies of various size needles. You can't really see it in that picture. Uh, number eight needles are for the waistline unit, number 11 for the bust unit, and number seven for the back unit. The front of the blouse is merely duplicated for the back, while back and front are joined on each side over the hips by divided triangle units on number 10 needles. The wing points of the third butterfly should be tipped with pearls, these points may cross on the shoulders, buttoning through the mesh back and front, bringing the blouse to whatever height is most becoming at the neckline, or the points may be knotted loosely, dropping the evening blouse to a low open neck. And so this is the first picture of the blouse. And it looks like it's kind of higher. And it, it also looks like the the tips, like the back is kind of like connected over here. And so if you look at this on, on me, she talks about having pearls, like you should use pearls. <laughs> well, I didn't have pearls. And when I was at Joann's or Walmart or wherever I was looking for buttons and beads, I forgot about the pearls. And so right now my, <laughs> mine is held together with stitch markers. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of loose. If I was to wear it in the, well, let me show you how it looks first. And then I'll kind of like, reposition it so you can see like what it could look like in another way. So the way she, she says that you that you have to wear it or that you can wear it, she says there's no seam above the waistline. Okay, so that's what I did. 
Virginia, <laughs> no seam above the waistline. Um, but what I, but that means, you know, it's always like, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure if we look at the picture in the book, there most definitely is a seam above the waistline because all this sweet girl has underneath is she's got on a bra underneath. <laughs> and so there's a seam above the waistline. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put a seam above the waistline. Um, I haven't decided like how, probably about right there. Um, and it's like, it's very loose right now. It's very loose, which I think is the intention um, because it's for, for evening wear apparently. But I think the, um, the idea with this is that you can, cause you know, these are supposed to be tipped with pearls, right? And so if we do it like, like she has it done in the book, you can like just connect, connect it here like that and, you know, tighten this, this whole thing up so it's not so, it's not so drapey. And again, this will look better once I've got pearls and it's not held together with, with stitch markers, but I think this more closely, whoops, this more closely resembles like what's, what's going on in the book there. And I think there's another, uh, another picture. Of it. Oh yeah, here it is. Here you can see, so like this unit here is on, I think she said eights. Um, this one was on tens. This was, uh, oh no, 11. So it goes eight, 11, uh, seven. And then these two side units are on tens. And so I use a little bit tighter gauge than she did. And so my, um, my needles were a little smaller, but it was the same idea. Um, so unit number one is on size eights. This one was on size 11. This is on seven and these were on tens. And it's very, it's very easy. It's, it is very easy. That being said, those side units, like how, I'm a good knitter. I'm a good knitter. And it took me four times to knit the triangles on the sides. Like <laughs> four times. I got the first one done. And then the second one, I'm like, all I got to do is attach the sides and, you know, pick up from each side, knitted, divided triangle, done. And the first time I think I, um, I, I dropped a stitch somewhere. Oh no, I had the wrong number of stitches. And so when I got to the, the end, I was almost done. I had six stitches on one side and three stitches on the other. And like, where did I screw up? I don't know. And so the sec the second time I like ripped it all out, reconnected everything. I knit it perfectly. I broke the yarn. I went to, I went to hold it up and look at it. And instead of connecting the, the two halves of the sweater like this, I connected them like this. <laughs> one, of the, one side of the sweater was rotated 90 degrees. And so I'm in, I mean, you know, in bed knitting before bed and I, I, I shriek, ah, and Steve's like, what's wrong? I'm like, ah, <laughs> it was perfect. Like had the right stitch can and everything. And then the third time, uh, the third time, like right at the very, like one third of the way up, I had dropped a stitch at some point and I didn't catch it for like, I don't know, hours until I finished knitting the whole thing. And then I had to rip it out. So the fourth time, the fourth time I, I counted, I counted so much, I counted so hard. <laughs> the fourth time I, I got it. <laughs> so that was, that was fun. Um, yeah, now that this whole thing is pinned up, I think I'm going to need to play with it because I need to decide like where to put the, where to put the seam because normally I like about, I like about a nine inch arm depth. I'm like very sensitive about things pinching me here. And when, one of the issues with this is like, I understand if it's like totally open, like there's no underarm sleeve seam, like that's very comfortable. But like if I, if I wanted to, um, adjust this and like put it, put it back to where it was, that's going to affect the, the depth of the underarm seam. You know, when you raise and lower this thing by, um, I don't know, 
five or six inches at a time, it's gonna it's gonna affect that seam. So I haven't I haven't determined how I'm gonna deal with that because you know if this is comfortable now, but then I raise the thing up like four inches, it's suddenly gonna get very uncomfortable. So I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Um, <laughs> it's a little risque. Yeah. <laughs> So one thing I haven't really talked about before that I love about Virginia, you guys, when she published this book, she was 62. She was, she was 62. <laughs> like, you know, we only have like two pictures of her. Um, I think one from the, um, the inside of the book, right? We got this one. And then there's also one um, that I found on a number knitting pamphlet. Is you know it's just her face. So like I don't know, I don't know how she dressed like the rest of the time. Maybe I'll I'll find out someday. But like the fact that she <laughs> she did this, she published this pattern at age 62 and said there's no need for a seam above the waistline. Like <laughs> yeah, right on Virginia. Oh, love it. <laughs> um, Rose said, I would avoid that by using markers every 10 stitches. You know, I thought about that, but the issue with the divided triangle is that it's, the way that you, you knit it is you, uh, at the beginning of every odd row, you, you know, knit two together at the, at the edge, double knit two together in the center, and knit two together at the other edge. And so there's a four, decreases every odd row and then on the even rows you knit across and so like with a miter square you're just you're just decreasing in the center and so like the stitch count only changes on the outside which is fine but with the the squares the divided squares it's it's changing both in the center and on the outside and so it complicates things um i mean i suppose i could still try to use stitch count stitch markers but like Maybe that's just too much for my little brain to handle. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, Morris says, that would look great over a black dress. Oh, could you sew the back triangles down at the neckline and bring the neckline up further? I could. Yeah. And I, the, if you look at the, the pattern, the way it's um, in the book, I kind of think, I kind of think that's, what they did because it's snug here like there's no opening when I when I did you know pinned it down with the little stitch marker there was like a gap um, kind of in this area and there's not here and so I kind of feel like maybe they just like sewed it instead of just pinning it with the um, the beads as she described but yeah that would look that would look great over a black dress um, do I have a black dress? I think I do. Pretty sure it has tags on it because um, I don't ever go anywhere fancy. <laughs> given, given my druthers, I'm a jeans and flannel kind of girl, um, but I have a black dress uh, and a pair of high heels that I've worn once, um, just in case. <laughs> I don't know for what, <laughs> but I have them just in case. Um, Rose says regarding the stitch, the stitch markers, you only count the sections that are changing to confirm count. You know, I should do that. Next time I do a divided square, I'm going to try that method. Cause if it's just like, you know, a 20, a 20 by 20 divided square, like that's not even worth it. But if it's like this, like this one, it was a 50 by 50. And so there's a lot more, there's a lot more stitches to lose track of. And incidentally, when I was sewing in my ends or weaving in my ends or whatever, I found, um, I found another drop stitch and I was like, nope, done. <laughs> I am done. It was on the edge though, so I could hide it pretty well. Like the other one was like right, right in the middle. And so if I, you know, if I would have just like snugged it up with some extra yarn, it would have been more obvious. Well, maybe not to anyone else, but to me it would have. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this is the Greenwich blouse. Yeah, um, we are also 
if you if you want to knit the winged blouse like rose is doing she's doing great unit 19 good job rose power through you got this <laughs> um that that pattern is available in the the link below um in the description until 9 30. so even if you don't knit it you just like want to get it for later go for it um that there's also a stitch calculator because the the pattern in the book it used like a different um, like a different gauge than I wanted to and a different size uh, and so I wanted I wanted to make some adjustments um, but it only came in one size in the book and so I came up with a stitch calculator that is also in the the description below you just plug in your bust measurement and I think your um, your gauge for like the the bust units and it calculates how many stitches you need like per per each box on the graph paper and also the the five points scarf this is the the five point scarf i made two of these and this one was a, a bigger a bigger version i'm excited to try this try wearing this this summer no this winter because it's it's summer now i think we just i think fall started today we went on a walk yesterday and like I don't know 20 neighbors were out like people i haven't seen leave their house in months <laughs> they were out <laughs> i was like it's official <laughs> the neighborhood's coming to life again <laughs> um yeah so it's summer now it will be fall pretty soon i guess it i guess it is fall um today and so but winter's coming and then i'll be able to wear this little this little number um yeah, and the links uh, are below to all the all these pages in Ravelry that have all these patterns, or where they don't have the patterns. But like part of what I what I did early on in this process, um, I went through and I added all seventy four of these patterns. I added them into the Ravelry database. So like if you have a copy of the physical book, a copy of the ebook, or if you're getting like the you know the links that I'm posting for the different patterns, and you want to tag your Ravelry project all the patterns are there and you can you can tag away um and so um yeah all those links are down are down in the bottom um yeah i just i want to give virginia credit where credit is due and so all of these are listed as her being the designer uh of course like i've redrawn the charts and you know colorized the pictures and stuff but like i didn't come up with this stuff she did she's she's brilliant and we love her <laughs> so um I think that's about that's about it for me tonight. Um, Rose says I do have a say on the winged blouse. Mm -hmm. Go down a few inches on the bust because it will stretch a lot. You know this is true. I think the original pattern said it was for like a 28 inch bust or maybe a 30 inch bust. It's it was small, but it does it does stretch a lot. A lot of the number knitting items they stretch. They stretch a lot, some more than others. Um, yes, <laughs> it's it's hard it's hard to tell you know like how much it's going to stretch. Like I have found that um, that the sweaters that are that are strictly like um, based on a chevron shape, like the where is it called the uh, woolen. It's in this section this one oh my goodness i still have yet to make this one successfully so if you look at the way this one is um is shaped the the cast on is all this is all one edge and this is all one unit and the arms are like divided squares but the sweater the body of the sweater itself is all one unit and because of that all of the weight of the sweater it just pulls downward and the thing the thing stretches like at least 30 percent and normal sweaters don't really do that <laughs> it's, it's like it's ridiculous how much that thing stretches um, but i found that the sweaters that are more like um let me show you these ones that are composed more of individual units like this is the this is the Hampton shirt. It says it's for men, but it's, you know, it's the Hampton shirt for men. It's like a vest kind of a thing. So this is composed of individual units 
And if you notice that the way that the, the knitting goes in uh, like each mitered square, the knitting, it, it's got a crossway stretch. And so that, that makes it like, it, you know, it stretches in multiple directions, but it also like holds together in multiple directions. Um, more so than if it was just knit on in like one single, one single piece. And the, the same is true with this one. This is the, um, the diamond, the diamond design sweater for, I think she calls it for men. Um, I mean, I made it for me. It's, uh, it's for a woman in this case, but it's, it's composed of, of individual units. Um, I think you can see it better if I turn it the other way. Yeah. Virginia liked to outline all of her stitches in chain stitch, and so that, that makes it easier to see. Um, and so it's, it's the same idea in that the, it's got this crossway stretch, which kind of, it makes it more stretchy, but also makes it more resilient so it won't stretch out of shape. Um, yeah. All right, friends. Um, I think that's, there's my notes. I think that's it for me tonight. Um, I have to, I think I need to do, um, not, I was originally doing it every week, doing these, um, every week because I could, <laughs> but um, my travel schedule is is a little hectic for work, um, and so it seems to me that about once every like every other week is very much more manageable for me. That way, I've got like plenty of time to do like all the historical research and the scanning, and like you know go get more books from the library and all that. And I feel like I can do a better job if I just do it every other week instead of every week. And so um, we will do this again. Today is the 17th. We'll do this again on October, October 1st. Yes, October 1st. And I don't know if, um, if any of you are going to Rhinebeck, but I'm going to Rhinebeck. I don't remember when it is, but um, I'm gonna be there. And so if you're gonna be there, do let me know because I'd love to meet some of you in person. Uh, Maura says, um, uh, I scored a copy of a treasury of knitting patterns at a library sale. Should I put a couple of stamps out and send it to you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I used to have, I used to have a copy of, I used to have a copy of it. I might have, um, done something stupid and sold it. Like when my friend Jackie sold me like 300 knitting books for $100. I had nowhere to put them and they were making my shelves buckle. And so I just like, I did a fire sale and I sold so much. And I think I might have sold all my Barbara Walker books, which is, you know, idiotic. Um, now, now I have a little bit more square footage and I just hide the books. <laughs> they're like under the bed and they're in the closet and they're up high and they're down low and they're like behind the door. They're like, they're they're everywhere, but I'm a lot less quick to get rid of knitting books now. Um, which version of it, um, Treasure of Knitting Patterns, because I think there was like, I think there was four. Um, let me know which one it is and I'll let you know if I have it. And um, yeah, we will, I'm gonna break that on my list to email you more uh, about that. That would be, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be at Rhinebeck. Hopefully, hopefully maybe some of you will be there as well. And um, it'll be my first time going to Rhinebeck. I've gone to some. I went to like a small fiber festival here in Raleigh a few years ago, smallish. Um, but I've never been to like the big one. So that should be that should be really fun. Um, I'm excited. And Steve is coming with me. So yeah, we'll we'll both be there. Uh, at the sheep parade and seeing all the vendor booths and it, it should be tons of fun. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Also, we're going wrapping up in that, that Northeast trip. We're going to go to Maine and we're going to go to Castine and Elliot and Blue Hill Falls and like all the places that Virginia mentions in her book. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go see like where she lived. So that's pretty exciting. So, um, I'll take, I'll take videos 
and pictures and I will share them. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. For me, it's 7.20. Um, thank you so much for coming. This has been super fun. And I, I love having you as my knitting friends and like this creative outlet and, and knitting along with me. And um, yeah, I will have more good stuff for you in two weeks from now. All right, thanks ladies. <laughs>